Hello and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of short stories everywhere. Today we're listening to Efflorescence, written by Mickey Lentin. You all right, Jerry asked Ross, while fiddling with a bit of grit in the pocket of his shorts. Yeah, Ross says, raising his chin. You? Yeah. Yeah, fine. Kids? Fine, yeah, you know. Ross pauses. Mel? She's good, yeah. The girls? Doing well. School's good. Yours? Still at uni. Having a great time, so I'm told. Claire? Jerry catches Ross's eye. Ross shrugs, looks away, and rests his arse against the curved bricks on the waist-high wall in front of a garden on the pavement where they've bumped into each other, the same wall that Jerry has watched being built over the last few months, following its progress on his nightly walks. See, they've finished the wall, Ross says, slapping the bricks. Jerry looks at Ross quizzically. He wants to know if Ross has been following the building of this particular wall on this particular road. This was his walking route. Took them long enough. Months they've been at it, Ross says. Looks good though, don't you think? You're joking me? Looks nice, yeah, but black bricks? I don't think so. Ross's belly wobbles. They obviously haven't thought of the efflorescence. Efflo what? Ross closes his eyes and shakes his head. He does this. Salt deposits. Get left behind when water evaporates after the water table drops. It seeps up to the surface of the bricks, like a stain it is. It's powdery, so you can rub it off. But it's a hard water area around here. So look. He rubs the bricks. You can already see it coming up. Never goes away, and bloody hard to get rid of, if you ask me, Ross says. Since when did you become such a brick expert? Ross tilts his head, as if trying to get some water out of his ear. I like to stay informed, he says. Jerry smiles, not knowing what else to say. Efflorescence. He mouths a few times, rolling the word around in his mouth. He must look it up on Google when he gets home. It's another Tuesday night. Jerry had showered. He showers every night at nine. He likes the hot water scalding his back after a day at his desk, the jump of his heart when he turns the knob to cold, the steam surrounding him. He picks at a spot between the folds of his gut. He hates his gut, his man breasts, the stretch marks on his thighs that look like those marinated anchovies. He conditions his beard and massages his face. Some radio burble is barely audible over the shower. Opening his mouth to streams of hot water, he swirls, gargles and spits. Drying the fissured skin between his toes, Jerry can't seem to get a dream from the night before out of his head. He's never been arrested, so what did the policeman with the square shoulders and the silver stars on his lapels want from him? Those shoulders filled his frame of vision, and he can still feel a pair of handcuffs cutting into the skin on his wrists. A shower, then a stroll. Something to look forward to. He'd started this new routine, as he likes to call it, a few months ago. Mel, his wife, thinks it's odd. And why doesn't he want to watch a box set or something? Relax, have a drink even. But he says there's nothing to watch these days. Well, there's too much to watch and he can't decide what to watch. And anyway, his walks cool him down, refresh his eyes. Today is no different. Before he leaves, he stands in the doorway to the lounge and looks at Mel from behind. She's sitting on the sofa, earbud in one ear, laptop on her knees, the sound of her nails on her keyboard, catching up on emails or whatever it is she does at this time. He rubs his neck, where she nibbled him a few months ago, the sting coming back to him, and how he wasn't sure how he'd cover the teeth marks when he went to the pub, and what he would tell the lads, and would they snigger about it when he went for a piss at half time. But then he never went to the pub anymore. She hasn't done it since. For a moment, 
Jerry wants to stroke her neck, like he used to in bed, or just tap her on the head. Get off, will ye? She would no doubt say. So he doesn't either. Grabs his keys and phone and edges the front door closed behind him. The air is tight, a warmth like the heat from the bonnet of a car shimmers off the road, a smell of gardens being watered. Jerry pinches his t-shirt away from his chest. His trainers rip like sellotape on the fresh tarmac pavement. How he'd love to skateboard down the smooth pavement, bending his knees, one arm in front, the other behind, the wind blotting the sweat on his bald head. If only he owned a skateboard. If only he could skateboard. Jerry could, of course, get in the car and go for a drive, like he used to when the girls were young. Football, swimming, brownies. He'd felt useful, something to do. Gave him a chance to listen to the radio and catch up. So he had things to talk about, an opinion to air, stay informed. The girls were gone now, the house was quiet. The car left to get sticky from the sap of the trees. He only used it on the weekend. These days, Jerry walks. He likes the quiet, past the boxing club, the shell garage, the basketball court with the torn nets, the convenience store with fruit and veg, is left to shrivel outside. And it's not that he minds if he bumps into someone he knows, as he's rehearsed what to do. Tilt up his chin, wave across the street, or shout a quick, how are you? He's being polite after all, and wouldn't the others do the same? But really, he prefers to walk alone. Ten minutes later, Jerry crosses Topsfield Road and takes a left at Heaton Drive. It's there at the brow of the hill where Heaton meets Clifton, where the newly finished garden walls curve around the pavement, the same wall that he's seen being built over the past few months, that he spots a distinctive figure of Ross running towards him, that gangly run, his curly hair bouncing on his head, wearing a loose white t-shirt. As Ross approaches, Jerry's feet become heavy, and for a few seconds, all of his options run through his mind. Say hi and continue to walk around the corner without stopping. Avoid eye contact. Start to run. Do a speed walking routine. Point to his phone to show that he's mid-conversation. But as quickly as his thoughts enter his mind, Ross is standing in front of him, breathless. His nose dripping, sweat patches dotting his chest. Jerry now also rests his arse on the garden wall, not too close to Ross, but close enough that he can catch a whiff of bread. He doesn't know what to say. All he can think of is that the leaves in the front yard need sweeping, and he could try and do it before he goes to bed. But by then it would be dark, and the security light isn't strong enough to light the whole drive. But then again, at least he'd get it done, and that will be okay. Been running much? Jerry asks. I can't fucking run anymore. I'm on the smokes again, so... Ross says, inhaling sharply. Likewise. On the six? No, running kills my hips. Well, you know what they say. Back by 40, hips by 50, knees by 60. Who says that? Don't know. I think I read it somewhere. Jerry tries not to, but he can't help looking Ross up and down. He's wearing... Culotte like shorts. How can he run in those? A double chin furls from his neck. His hair, usually tidy, is matted with sweat, and his pond like eyes look grey and misty in the light. But it is his shoulders that Jerry can't get over. Jerry knows about Ross's often extreme push up routines, but this evening he looks different. His pecs pressed against his t shirt are square like a toy superhero, as if a fake chest had been stuck onto his slim frame. It's been some months since Jerry has seen Ross. He knows that at some stage he'll bump into him. They only live a few roads from each other, but he doesn't picture it like this. He's heard bits and pieces about Ross and Claire from Mel, that Claire had got the house and Ross is now living in a flat above the laundrette, which is next to the bakery 
and that his clothes constantly smell of bread. He gets to see the kids twice a week. Jerry had arranged to meet him for a pint after he broke up with Claire, but had cancelled on him by text when Ross was already at the pub saying he wasn't well. But really, Jerry just didn't feel like it. He couldn't think of what he'd say, and ever since he'd felt bad about it, and Mel had told him he'd been cruel for not apologising. Look, I, d I don't want to disturb your run, Jerry says, standing up. You're not. I need a break. This hill kills me every time. Ross digs into his pocket and takes out a box of cigarettes. One of the ones with a picture of a pair of bleeding lungs. He taps the box against his other hand, pulls one out with his teeth and lights it. Want one? Ross asks, his cigarette dangling from his bottom lip. Jerry hesitates. Of course he wants one, but he knows that the smoke would make his clothes and beard smell, and Mel would notice, unless he manages to walk through the lounge and into the bathroom to brush his teeth. But then she'd ask him why was he brushing his teeth after a walk and not before bed as he usually did. And this was linked to having late night showers, and Jerry would have to make up an excuse, like he had some garlicky breath or something. He scratches the spot on his gut. Love one, Jerry says. Jerry sits back down, this time closer to Ross. He taps his cigarette in tandem with Ross, letting the ash float to the ground by his feet. He doesn't speak as, as he smokes, as if it's a ritual that demands his undivided attention. Apart from a scooter that roars past, the only sound is the paper and the tobacco sizzling in the night air. Fancy keying some cars, Ross asks, flicking his cigarette stub into the air, sparks hanging in the dusk after it. What? Jerry asks, now light-headed, his eyes scratching. Keying a car, you know. I know what keying is. I saw it on this French film. Can't remember what it's called, but this father character just goes around telling really bad dad jokes and keying cars. It's not even funny. I think I saw it with Claire. Anyway, he doesn't scratch loads of cars, just one or two a day, but he takes a key between his thumb and forefinger like this. Ross pinches his two fingers together, and as he's walking past a Peugeot or a Renault or one of those, he just runs the key along the bodywork. I didn't know you liked French films. Claire liked it. What do you say? Don't be ridiculous. It's easy. You go on with your walk and I'll finish my run and we'll meet in 15 minutes. I'm not doing that. Mel's expecting me back. No, she's not. What if someone sees me? No one's going to see you. It's practically dark. Ross shakes his head again. You're on your own on this one. Jerry laughs, a hesitant laugh, a laugh that catches in his throat, a laugh that ends with a half smile. I haven't been caught yet. I do one most evenings. Really? I haven't done your Honda, by the way, in case you're wondering. Jerry doesn't know whether to stand or sit on the wall, so he stands and bends one foot against the wall, the sole of his trainer rubbing against the efflorescence that sprinkles on the ground like some flower staining the pavement. His shoulders are tight, his stomach empty, his tongue sandy, the cheesy taste of the supermarket lasagna that they picked at for dinner in his mouth. Look, Ross says, I go down Fairlight and up Hobton, right at Carling and up at the hill, and then back past the library and back up. We'll each choose a car as we go and meet outside the school, and then we can walk back the rest of the way and compare notes. I've already spotted this Hyundai I want to do. Lovely silver thing. What do you think? It's nothing, come on. Ross rubs his hands together. Uh, uh, you go ahead, I, I won't tell you. Jerry mumbles. Suit yourself. It's just, there is no just. Jerry desperately tries to think of a just, that he had to finish some work, put the bins out, put the washing away. But he knows that anything he says would sound as if he were making some excuse. As if he was making an excuse. And now he feels bad, as if he said no, he'd be letting Ross down again. Come on, 
Live a little, Ross says, lightly punching Jerry on his shoulder. All right, Jerry stutters, not knowing what to say. Fifteen minutes, Ross asks. At the school, OK? Jerry nods. Right then, see ya. Ross jumps off the wall and starts running down the hill. Jerry waits for Ross to disappear down the other side of the hill before setting off. A quick glance at his phone, close to ten. A chill runs over his body, like when the pressure drops just before it rains. He knows the area well, but at the moment he can't quite follow Ross's directions. Walking underneath a disused railway bridge, a fox thrashing in the flower bed startles him, its searching eyes fixed on his. He walks on, pondering if he should just skip meeting Ross at the school and go straight home. He could always text him and tell him he'd keyed a car, but Ross was now expecting him to turn up. The night was pulling him in as he fiddled with the keys in his pocket. Which key would he use? The chub? No, that would leave too deep a scratch. His Yale house key? Too obvious. And if he dropped the key, it could be traced if it came to that. D-lock for his bicycle? Too circular. He chose his office drawer key. Small, sharp, useless. He could easily chuck it after he did the task. That's if he was going to do the task. Walking up Fairlight, Jerry looks at every car as he passes to see if it's been scratched and runs his fingers nonchalantly along a couple of cars' doors to check for scratches in the paintwork. As he does, he glances over his shoulder, moving his eyes this way and that, checking for people watching him and other pedestrians who no doubt would think he was trying to steal their car. A mist gathers on his forehead. His breath shortens. Mel would be wondering where he'd got to. He checks his phone. Nothing. What's he doing? This is ridiculous. But something gnaws at him that maybe Ross is right. Maybe he'd enjoy the feeling. Maybe he should live a little. A tiny scratch wouldn't hurt. It would be their secret. They could compare notes. They could create a private online map and place dots on all the roads where they'd scratch cars. Every night they'd do a different car, maybe in alphabetical order by make of car. Cars of neighbours they don't like, SUVs that take his parking place, estate agents, yes, estate agents cars, those ones with their decal marketing your lovely new home. Scratchers, they call themselves, scratchers. Jerry takes in the cool air. Okay, he thinks. Just a little scratch, a quick one. He chews a banjaxed car down the side street. No one would see. This would be his first. The sky is now clear, deathly dark. An orange hue from the street lights on the pavements. Jerry ups his pace, feeling for the key to his drawer office, gripping the tip between his first finger and thumb, feeling the cut edges on his cuticles. There, that one, a Ford Fiesta, silver, Enreg, rain-stained windows, dent on the passenger door, loose bumper, rusty chips on the bonnet, torn windscreen wiper, piles of stuff on the back seat, pebble dash houses down one side of Topsfield Park, TVs flicker behind drawn blinds, a distant siren wails. Jerry blinks rapidly and senses a sneeze, but holds it back. The silver ford before him, he edges towards it, the key now in his left hand, the tip of the metal glinting in the light, his breath sharp, his heart in his throat. A door slams behind him. He turns his head robotically and sees a man drop a bin liner into a wheelie bin. For a moment, Jerry wants to wave at the man as if to say, I'm not doing anything. I'm just looking around. Yeah, I, I live close by. Yeah, this car belongs to a friend of mine. I'm just looking for a jumper I left in there. But he doesn't. A dog's bark cracks the night. Quick, Jerry says under his breath. Quick. He fumbles the key in his sweaty hand. He walks purposefully along the side of a car. And as he walks, time slows. And for a brief moment, all he can see are Ross's shoulders in his vision and the handcuffs on his skin, twisting, burning his wrists. He inhales deeply, looks away from the car, 
as it might when having an injection. Grips the key and hears the rip of the cut along the silver paint like a knife slicing porcelain, a ribbon of metal curling at one end, splintering his fingertip. Jerry stops, expecting an alarm, a shout, his heart now in his throat. He holds his breath as he runs his finger along the scar of the car, feeling the sharpness of the sliced bodywork on his skin, enjoying the edges prickling his nerve endings, just like the bite Mel gave him. He spots a shadow turn off a light in a house across the road. His feet tingle, the hairs on his arms stand up. And now there is a lightness in his legs, a clearness in his mind, a fizz in his fingers, an ease across his face. And just like that, he shuffles back to the middle of the pavement, throws the key under another car and walks towards the school. Ten minutes later, Jerry arrives at the school gates. No sign of Ross. He bends one foot against the gate, the efflorescence on the soles of his shoes sprinkling on the metal. He rubs his fingers together where the key indented his skin. He leans his body forward to see if Ross is running down the hill. He fumbles for his phone. Mel has texted. Are you coming home? He waits. That was Efflorescence, written by Mickey Lenton and read by Francis Gilbert. Come back next month when we'll be interviewing Mickey about his new short story collection, Inner Core. Thanks for listening to Story Radio, and don't forget to subscribe. Goodbye.